We're still stuck in like 1970 diagnosis of heart disease right now. And it's unfortunate because all we're really looking at is your cholesterol levels, right? And people are still looking at the very basic cholesterol levels, LDL, total cholesterol. And, you know, a lot of times no one knows what their, most of my patients don't know their cholesterol levels. You need to become the CEO of your own health, right? Hey everyone, in honor of our 500th episode, we have a special guest for you today. Dr. Darshan Shah is a longevity specialist, board certified surgeon, and founder of Next Health, the world's first and largest health optimization and longevity clinic. He earned his medical degree at the age of 21, becoming one of the youngest physicians in the country. Now Darshan focuses on a personalized data-driven approach to health optimization, including the game-changing treatments that will transform longevity as we know it. I'm talking about NAD infusions, ozone therapy, cryotherapy, testosterone replacement therapy, and the technologies and testing available to help us identify diseases like cancer and heart disease at the earliest stages. If you've ever been curious about what the future of longevity treatments look like, this episode paints a pretty clear picture. I can't think of a better conversation for our 500th episode. Darshan, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. So honored to be here. Great to see you. It's been too long. And uh, yeah, I think it's been four years. Four years since the last Revitalize. <laughs> since our last great event. Uh, but it's great to have you. Congrats on Next Health. Uh, you guys are doing some really interesting and extraordinary uh, forward thinking treatments over there. But before we jump into that, can you talk a little bit about your background and personal journey, which ultimately led to your to your work at Next? Yes, for sure. So I'm a physician. Um, I ended up becoming a physician really early in life at 21 years old. I just kind of rushed through school. And um, while I was in medical school, I spent a day with a surgeon and I decided like this being in the operating room is the most incredible thing on the planet and specifically operating on the heart and in trauma. And so I immediately, right after medical school, I jumped into trauma surgery, did that for many years, trained at the Mayo Clinic in reconstructive trauma surgery as well and, and reconstructive plastic surgery. And um, after I got done with training, I decided to open my own practice, which you know, being a doctor in trauma and in reconstructive surgery, it takes up about 80 hours a week, but then opening a business takes up another like 80 hours a week, right? So you can imagine just like all entrepreneurs, I was uh, working a lot and I was stressed. I was eating whatever was basically put in front of me that I could get as quickly as possible. And I slept for five hours a night because I thought that was the best way to accelerate the business journey and just work as much as possible. And I ended up about 10, 15 years later as you know, a very, very sick individual. Um, I was 40 pounds heavier than I am right now. I um, was on three blood pressure medications and they just could not get my blood pressure under control. I was not sleeping at all. So the, you know, I talked to my primary care doctor and he's like, well, here's a little bit of Ambien for you. That'll help you get to sleep. And here's another blood pressure medication. And, you know, you seem like you're depressed about your, you know, your overall state of health. So here's some antidepressant as well. And so, you know, the medication list just kept growing and growing and growing. And, oh, and by the way, he said, maybe I should think about walking 10,000 steps a day. That would really help. <laughs> so as all of us that um, end up in a really bad spot, we sometimes have a life-changing moment, right? And that for me was the birth of my son, um, who's now nine years old. And I decided at that point in time, like I just did the math looking at death rates for people with these diagnoses at the age uh, at the age of 40 and i was predicted to have a, a lifespan of only like 50 years old and i thought there's no way i'm going to die before i see my kid graduate from college right so i decided at that moment in time i need to take some time off and get my health in order so took a year off of surgery i hired a ceo for my business hired some surgeons to come cover for me and uh, decided to go down the health health journey pathway. And I, I hired this really high powered, expensive concierge medicine doctor, and he took me under his wing. And he decided that, you know, I should probably be on some more medication. And maybe I started to start taking anti-diabetes medication because my sugar was going up too. 
And I'm like, this is not the direction I want to go. I was like going down the Western medicine rabbit hole and just getting put on more and more medications. And um, I thought it's time for a total re-education. Like in, you know, in medical school, we get probably one day total of nutrition and two hours of exercise um, training. And I decided I was going to go learn everything I could. And that's when I um, came to your conference, actually, and many others in functional medicine. And um, I actually became a personal trainer and a registered dietitian <laughs> myself as a physician, just so I could learn how to get myself healthy. And what I found out was that there was probably... I would like to talk about the Pareto principle, right? There's 20% of the actions that you can do that will give you 80% of the results. And I applied those just on a consistent daily basis. Every single day, I had my workout routine, my diet routine. I fixed my hormones. I fixed my inflammation. And I got healthy in like eight months. And I thought for, for sure, like, there's no one that could tell, no one that could tell me, like, where do I go to do all this? in one place. Like, why do I have to go to five different doctors and the gym and the cryo chamber and then this IV place? Like, I, and so I decided being an entrepreneur like you, Jason, I decided I got to put this all together under one roof because I was able to do it in eight months, get myself healthy. I can help others do it. And that's kind of the genesis of Next Health, which is kind of the next iteration of healthcare. So what ultimately worked for you in terms of diet? Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 top three things that worked for me was number one, the, and the one thing that worked the best for me was getting rid of all forms of processed food, just really learning how to eat. Um, Dr. Hyman's book, Food, What the Heck Should I Eat, like, guided me. And I was able to immediately start shedding pounds once I stopped all processed food, just went with um, you know, 80% um, vegetable diet and really increase my protein intake. And so I did that on, on the diet front, sleeping seven to eight hours a night. Back then there was no aura ring. So I um, had some other monitors that I started using and really dialed in my deep sleep, which was really difficult to do initially, but I, I kept making changes to my sleep routine and also my sleep environment until I got to that point. And then getting my hormones fixed was, was a massive change and then really focusing on inflammation. So obviously like eating clean helped reduce inflammation, but so did fixing my sleep, getting out there and exercising and focusing on zone two and zone five, hit exercising on a daily basis was really what turned my health around quickly. And so what was off with your hormones? So I had a I had a massive testosterone deficit. I was forty years old with a testosterone level of a eighty year old. How low? Yeah, it was it was down under two hundred, under two hundred, like one eighty, one two hundred sometimes. And so you know I, I tried all the regular stuff you do to get your testosterone. I was lifting heavy weights, increasing my protein, et cetera, et cetera. But it just wasn't working. So I went on testosterone replacement therapy, was which was massively helpful for me. Wow. So do you think that that's something that's definitely in the news a lot right now, because the numbers aren't good. Uh, if you look at men in their 20s and 30s, I think we're at all time lows in, in terms of testosterone. Uh, what do you think is driving it? Yeah, I think we're living in one of the most toxic and inflamed societies that humans have ever lived in ever, right? And there's a lot of different contributing factors to that. It's not just the external toxins that come in our processed food that come in our cosmetics that we use and our soaps and our shampoos, but it's and, and like, you know, the amount of mercury that we have in our food as well is horrible. Um, but it's also the internal toxic environment that we develop ourselves as well. We don't take care of our gut health. We don't sleep enough. We don't, um, you know, we don't get out there and move enough. And all of this leads to a tremendous amount of inflammation in our body. And that inflammation pretty much attacks every single system of our body, including our hormones. So it's it's a it's a massive attack of inflammation at a deeply biological level on a cellular basis that's causing this due to all those factors, combination of factors. And so you mentioned lifting heavier weights didn't didn't really work, eating more protein. Something I'm curious your take on, which would fall under the the natural lifestyle modification realm, which I've seen that maybe works, cold therapy. Cold plunge. Yeah. Um, I think any of the different hormetic therapies are definitely helpful um, just because you drive energy production at a mitochondrial level, um, including cold therapy, heat sauna therapy, and things like hyperbaric oxygen therapy as well. All these things that cause your cells to undergo that process of hormesis can really help drive down inflammation and, and also increase hormone levels. Fascinating. So 
assume our listener is, you know, they got the basics covered. They're, they're eating right in terms of avoiding processed foods. They figured out uh, what they need for protein, whatever their mix is. Everyone's different in terms of their, their uh, <clears throat> mix of animals and plant foods. Assume, assume they've got that covered. Assume they're, they're moving every day. Assume sleep is dialed in. But they, they, they're looking for the next thing. The, the next treatment, the modality, protocol, whatever we want to call it, that's on the cutting edge for those who want to really maximize their lifespan and health span. And so what are, what are some of those things in your mind that can help someone take it to the next level? Right. So, you know, I see hundreds of patients a month and we, we have this conversation and I really, like you said, once you get those factors dialed in, which I assume your listeners are experts that listening to your podcast, um, then we really want to take them through a little bit of a journey where we first focus on how not to die, right? That's that's step one. How do we not die? So, and then once you got that down, then the last piece of this is the advanced longevity technologies that we can talk about what we do at Next Health. But when we talk about how not to die, I show them the list of the CDC's top 10 causes of death. And Number one is heart disease, right? Heart disease kills more people in the Western world than the next three top causes of death combined. After that is cancer, and then it's injuries. So just, you know, unintentional injuries after that. And um, we won't talk about COVID because COVID rates are declining um, exponentially. But the other two things are heart disease, stroke, and metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and Alzheimer's. So those, those are the four top causes of death, cancer, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, and Alzheimer's. And I tell them, like, you know, most people have a Western medicine doctor, a primary care doctor that they assume that they assume are taking care of these four things. But I can tell you nine times out of 10, they're, they're nowhere near in the realm of, first of all, you know, screening for these things, but secondly, even suggesting the more advanced screening that's available now. So we can dive a little bit deeper into those four topics. I think it'd be really helpful for your listeners. Sure. Let's do it. Let's start with heart disease. Yeah. Yeah. So heart disease, um, really we're still stuck in like 1970 diagnosis of heart disease right now. And it's unfortunate because all we're really looking at is your cholesterol levels, right? And people are still looking at the very basic cholesterol levels, LDL, total cholesterol. And, you know, a lot of times no one knows what their, most of my patients don't know their cholesterol level. Some of the more advanced patients do know their cholesterol level, but they're not following it on a consistent basis of really tracking it. So it'll be like 20 years before they find out that they're in a really bad place with heart disease. And so what I do with all my patients is starting at the age of like 35, I introduce them to a few cholesterol markers that they really need to watch on their own. So I do a big, long talk that like you need to become the CEO of your own health, right? If you run a business, you're looking at numbers on a quarterly basis, monthly basis, weekly basis. With your body, you need to do the same thing. So you should follow this level called your ApoB level. ApoB is a combination of all the, I will say, bad cholesterol and quotation marks that's in your bloodstream right now. And you really want to get that dialed in somewhere under the level of 150 or so. And so, and if you have- 150? That seems high. No, for ApoB, that's actually, you know, you want to be somewhere between 50 to 150 is your normal band with ApoB. Got it. So on that one specifically, I just want to spend a minute on ApoB because we've had Peter T on the show. His view is this is one where a lifestyle can only get you so far. And he articulated that, you know, in many instances, he's not a fan of pharmaceuticals. But in this specific instance, he is in that in his view, it was very difficult to get ApoB under 70. So personally, I'm at 79. And if you wanted to get under 70 and bring it to the 30s, what he he describes as childlike levels, you're essentially taking heart disease off the table. However, the only way to get there is through pharmaceutical. And that takes it completely off the table. Do you have a view on, <laughs> on, on that thesis? Yeah. Um, it's a very controversial topic. And, you know, you have all these people that are so anti-statin right now and the other pharmaceuticals like Zetia and some of the other ones. But what I can tell you, just tracking the massive amount of research, I mean, this is, these pharmaceuticals have 
research more than any pharmaceutical by a factor of like 50. Um, I'm in complete agreement with Peter Atia. I think if you have any risk of heart disease or plaque development, um, getting your ApoB down to childlike levels is, is urgent right? Because all you're going to do is keep going in the wrong direction if you don't manage this. And I tell my patients, look, the best way to manage your cholesterol level is get all your lifestyle factors set, right? But just like Peter says, there's no way you're going to reduce it down to a level where you're actually reversing heart disease or taking it off the table just by doing that. And that's why it's the number one killer of the Western, Western society. On this one too, what I'm curious is, I think, you know, Peter is all about getting to 100%. And I think if you get it to 30 or 40, it's like 100% off the table. My question to you is, I don't know if we know the answer to it. This is, let's say if you're at 70, is it 85% off the table? And is 60, you know, 90% off the table? Because I think many people could probably live with that because, you know, I, I think getting to complete certainty on some of these lifestyle diseases would be <laughs> great if you could. But I think many would opt for getting 80 or 90 percent there without having to take a pharmaceutical right absolutely if you can get yourself to 80 and 90 if you get your apoB under 100 just with lifestyle factors that's fantastic like you probably don't need to consider a pharmaceutical unless you have like massive blockages in some of your arteries and I think you want to guide that I mean all this there's very specific protocols in the world of cardiology now and how to treat heart disease with pharmaceuticals, and it's all guided by a new type of scan, which I think everyone with any risk of heart disease should start getting. It's called the Clearly Heart Scan. And the Clearly Heart Scan looks at every artery of your heart and quantifies the level of hard plaque, which is calcified plaque, and soft plaque. So you get a really good understanding of how much plaque you have in these arteries. And so you can guide your therapy based on this scan. And so, um, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is it's not so kind of up in the air, whether you get to 85% or 90% or 70%. It's really, we know what your level should be based and what you should be treated with based on the level of narrowing of your arteries. And why this exam I've taken the clearly, why it's so important is, so for example, everyone should get a, ca a calcium score, M mine zero which is which is great but i do the clearly and i have a little soft plaque and this is why you should do the clearly because cal look everyone should have a zero cac but or a calcium is a cac or ca calcium score calcium score right. calcium score uh i'm thinking of a metric for for work uh <laughs> you thinking about customer acquisition cost <laughs> right customer yeah, yeah exactly i'm an entrepreneur too i'm thinking about cac if we had a zero cac it would be an amazing plate uh so but it doesn't the the calcium doesn't pick up soft and soft what we've learned is soft can do damage but the clearly picks up the soft and i have some soft plaque and like most people do it's important to know exactly and i think um in the past there was a little bit of concern about the radiation that you get with a full cat scan of your heart for the clearly but the radiologists have really dialed this in to where the radiation dose is pretty minimal. Um, look, the calcium score is still a great screening test. It's cheap. It's like a hundred bucks. You can get it. And I think that's, that, that's appropriate, but and at a very minimum, people should be getting the calcium score, but the clearly is definitely the next generation that I think that everyone of your audience needs to be aware of. And it takes like 20 minutes. It's quick. It's quick, easy. It's expensive though. I think it's like seven, 800 bucks if I recall. Right. But if you have an indication, usually your insurance should be able to cover it as well. So we've just got to kind of call around and, and talk to the radiology places about it. Got it. I'm so glad you mentioned the clearly because that's definitely the next generation of, of testing here. And anyone to avoid heart disease, get that scan. And then don't be scared of pharmaceuticals, especially on a temporary basis, especially if you do have some plaque in your arteries. Yeah, look, I, I for for many people, I the way I, I think what people struggle with is this idea of oh now I have to take this pharmaceutical for the rest of my life versus hey maybe this is a bridge to take me out of catastrophic risk range back to normal as I work on all the lifestyle. I think a lot of people can live with that versus do I have to take this for the rest of my life now? Right, right, yeah, very well said. And I, and you know whenever whenever I have this conversation with my patients, I always frame it like. Take this till we get you get to the rest of your lifestyle factors adjusted, and then let's reassess. But for now, like you said, get yourself out of the catastrophic risk category. <laughs> so, is there anything else on heart disease we should cover, or okay to move on to cancer? 
I think the, the next thing on heart disease too is, is don't forget stroke is also kind of under the same umbrella of cardiovascular disease. So if you have um, any plaque in your heart, you should also be taking a look at your carotid arteries with an ultrasound. It's another super easy test. The carotid arteries are the big arteries that feed your brain. Um, uh, and sometimes there's a lot of plaque in there too. And you know, stroke is one of the biggest causes of death as well. So don't forget about your carotid arteries in your neck and getting an ultrasound. And that's a CIMT, if I remember correctly. Exactly, yeah, there's an ultrasound of your neck that looks at that. Anything else on cardiovascular disease? No, I think we're good. I think we got some good um, high level points there. Uh, you want to talk about cancer next? Yes. Okay, great. So all of Western medicine is still recommending also um, your normal screening exams, which is colonoscopy. They, they brought down the age now to 45 when you should start, but I would say even younger, you should be doing colonoscopy. And also, you know, the PSA blood test for men to screen for prostate cancer and for women the mammogram and cervical exam but um like i said before cancer's biggest enemy is being diagnosed as stage one and almost every single person here about dying cancer dying of cancer now gets diagnosed way too late and it takes months to years for cancer to go from stage one to stage three or stage four so um there are some more advanced tests out now that I think everyone needs to consider as well. Um, the first thing is that there's a really accessible genetic test for cancer that tells you your cancer risk. So there's certain cancer genes like BRCA that put you at higher risk for breast cancer, um, et cetera. So knowing those genes, and if you're at higher risk for a specific kind of cancer, will definitely accelerate your screening for those cancers. So that, that test is called a color gene test. Um, just go to color.com slash cancer, and you can order it um, just you know as a home test kit. And that'll give you your cancer risk genes, which is really great to know. Um, so the other, the other thing point on cancer is that the normal screening is really helpful for like colon cancer and prostate cancer and breast cancer with a mammogram and cervical cancer with the with the pap smear but it ignores many of the other kind of cancers that kill us right like we've heard, we've all heard of people that have died of pancreatic cancer of lung cancer lung cancer is actually the number one deadly cancer out of all the cancers right now so i recommend taking screening to the next level and the next level of screening is full body mri CAT scan of the chest to check for lung cancer and the GRAIL gallery test. Um, so we could talk about each one of those a little bit as well. Okay. So um, you have the CT scan of the chest, with, which checks for lung masses. Now, a full body MRI is really not good for looking for lung masses. So if you've ever smoked, I would highly recommend getting a CT of your chest. And I recommend it for anyone over the age of 50, just at least once as a screening. But if they can get it every couple of years, it's a really good idea to find lung cancers. It's really easy to do at the same time you're doing the clearly test. They, they just kind of do it at the same time. They can look for any lung masses. So whenever I order a clearly test, I ask the radiologist to get a CAT scan of the chest at the same time. Um, the full body MRI, you've probably heard of Pernuvo and some of these other companies out there that are doing the full body MRI. Um, so this is great for looking for other solid mass masses that normally would never get diagnosed until it's way too late. Things like pancreatic masses, liver tumors, brain tumors, et cetera. Um, so I recommend a Pernuvo scan um, and uh, probably doing that every couple of years as well, um, or a full body MRI at another testing center that does something similar. And then lastly, have you heard of the Grail test yet, Jason? The gallery? Yes. yes. Quick question before we go to Grail, though. Would theoretically anything with the pancreas come up in a colonoscopy? No. No, if you're not going to see it in a colonoscopy, unless it's a massive mass that's pushing on your colon. The pancreas is a separate organ, and usually these masses are very tiny. So full body MRI is probably the best way to screen for it. And the Grail test. So the Grail test does find pancreatic cancers as well. Got it. Yeah. And just for your audience, so they understand what the grail test is, this is what's called a liquid biopsy, where we can actually take a blood test and find segments of what's called cell-free DNA of tumors. So tumor DNA floating around in your bloodstream can be 
found with the with the with this test using um, just a simple blood test. And so the fifth it detects fifty different types of cancers, and it can tell you if um, we you have a tumor developing very early, even before it's seen on like an MRI scan. So for someone, I'm curious. Would, would something show up in someone's labs and their red or white blood cells or platelet counts to tip them off before? Because what I don't want to do is, look, I think all these things are interesting, but I also don't want people listening to say, oh, I got to run out and do all these things right now. I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, and my understanding is usually something will happen in lab work around red, red white blood cells, platelet count. Maybe there's something else that would indicate some things may be off and then go do some of this testing. Is that accurate or no? It's half accurate. So um, those blood tests, the red cells, white cells, et cetera, they're only gonna change if you have a certain form of certain forms of blood cancer, right? Um, if your red cells go down because of a colon cancer is because you're bleeding in your colon with a huge cancer, right? So that's, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's a late indicator on your, regular blood tests. Sometimes we see inflammatory markers go up like HSCRP with some cancers. And in fact, I've diagnosed some cancers, uh, two specific indications, uh, incidences that I can remember just by looking at the HSCRP, but it's, these are all late signals, Jason. So, um, you're going to, you're going to find something really like later on. So essentially there's nothing in a, in like a, if someone does pretty exhaustive or, or blood work, there's nothing that's going to necessarily tip them off that there, there may be cancer growing or there is. There, there's definitely, I mean, there's definitely pictures that develop in the blood work that that could be an indicator, but it's very nonspecific and it happens very late. So um, I think, I think the way we diagnose cancer is going to change dramatically in the next 10 or 15 years, especially as this grail test becomes more affordable right now i think it's like 800 900 but you know th as we know like the cost of even sequencing your entire genome has gone from millions to just a few hundred dollars now right so this test is going to go down to a few hundred bucks and when it does i think what's going to happen with cancer is everyone's going to get this test on a yearly basis it's one of the primary modalities of screening for cancer would someone do grail over pranuvo or you would do both they're two different things. So the Pernuvo is um, going to look for not just solid tumors, but also for anatomical abnormalities, things like aneurysms, et cetera, other things that indicate other diseases as well. So I think Pernuvo is still very helpful in, in that fashion. But I think the GRAIL test is really specific for cancer and finding it super early before even the uh, Pernuvo scan can see it. How accurate is it right now? Very, there's like a 98% uh, sensitivity and specificity. So very, like pretty, pretty accurate. Now there are some false positives. And if you do have a positive, the first thing to do is not freak out. The second thing to do is do the test again. So then if you have two false positives, then we go down what's called the diagnostic pathway and we start really looking for these tumors. Now, um, you know, Peter Tia and, and others talk about, and I, I get concerned about this too, and I have a really long discussion before we do the GRAIL test on any of my patients, is that, look, like we're finding tumors very early and probably even earlier than your immune system has sometimes had a chance to address it. But it's still good to know, and it's still in. And if the immune system doesn't take care of it, we can get it super early and treat it before it becomes before it grows. Well, the the one I tend to think about in this situation is pancreatic cancer. That's the one where typically people find out when it's too late. And I know Maria Menounos just shared her personal story. She caught it early. She's lucky to be here. Right. Absolutely. And there's a lot of people, unfortunately, that have passed away from pancreatic cancer, famous people that, you know, if they had had the grail test, they would have known way ahead of time and a pernuva. So is there anything else on cancer we should cover? You know, I think there's one more thing that people should know about. You can easily on Amazon get what's called a fecal immunochemical test, a fit test. It's like 20, 30 bucks. And this is a test that you can do at home on a yearly basis and test for immunochemical signals of colon cancer. So um, I have a stack of them in my bathroom. We do them, you know, in our family on a yearly basis, and that can diagnose colon cancer way earlier. And um it's great because you're not going to undergo a colonoscopy every year, right? So this is this is a good way to uh, to look for that way out of time. Got it. I had my uh, colonoscopy 
I think two years ago, it was, I, I've talked about this on the show, so I apologize for those who've heard me tell this story, but my iron levels like precipitously dropped. And that's like, that's a, a usually could be a telltale sign. And so I got a colonoscopy and it turns out I was a hundred percent clean. And who knows something happened in my body where I just, what I'm not metabolizing iron. Yeah. Absorbing iron or metabolizing it. lots of different reasons to become anemic and colon cancer is definitely one of them. But um, the other big thing about a colonoscopy that people should know too, is you're not just looking for cancer, you're looking for polyps and, and, and those polyps can become precancerous. You can find stuff and treat it way ahead of time. That's why the colonoscopy is so important is because number one is diagnostic, but it's also therapeutic. You can also treat a, treat a polyp way years before it becomes a cancer. So I, I'm glad I did it because I, I started to freak out about it and uh, I'm glad, I, glad I got peace of mind. <laughs> yeah, very important. So in terms of some of the the more cutting edge treatments, let's let's just assume everyone's got this dialed in. They're doing their, their clearly, maybe they've done a Prunovo or a Grail, or maybe they're just not concerned about cancer and they feel good and they don't want to do it, which I also understand too. Um, what are some of the, the next level treatments that you do at next, which are particularly exciting that you personally do as well? Yeah. So yeah, when we opened next health, I just wanted everything in one place just for me to use, <laughs> like, you know, so I can, so I can go every day and use it. And it, I was like, well, just let's open it up for all my patients. But um, what I like to do, I call it like the longevity circuit, right? So there's certain technologies we talked about earlier that under that help your cells undergo a state of what's called hormesis. It stresses the cell just enough so that it goes into repair and rejuvenate mode. And those therapies are things like cold therapy, heat therapy, hyperbaric oxygen, et cetera. Even like extended fasting gets, gets your cells to kind of reset. And so what I do is I go in and I do a 30 minute heat sauna session. I go under red lights for 30 minutes. And then I do a cryotherapy session, which replaces the cold plunge for me. I actually have a cold plunge at home, but in next health, we have a cryotherapy changer. So um, that whole thing. And then, and then once a week, I'll do hyperbaric oxygen as well. So we have all that under one roof. Um, you know, a lot of people have access to places where they live that they can also do these therapies. If you don't, you can simulate these things in your own home by, you know, taking a cold shower or just uh, getting into a cold plunge. They're getting more and more available as our saunas. Um, so that's kind of what, that's kind of the longevity circuit that I do is I go through those um, pieces of technology, reset my biology at a cellular level, and then I do an IV treatment with NAD. NAD is a precursor to ATP um, that we have precipitous declines in as we age. And so I'll do an IV dose of NAD as well. That's, that's kind of like the level one thing that I do. <laughs> so let's deconstruct each one. So the first one was red light. Did I get that right? Red light. So, so why red light and who, who should consider red light? So I think red light is good for a lot of people. I mean, almost everybody should consider red light therapy. Um, a few things that it does is number one, it induces the production of nitric oxide um, in on, right underneath the level of your skin. It also improves hormone function and uh, hormone production, like testosterone production. And um, it, it also kind of resets your cellular biology as well. So I really like red light therapy. Um, and I mean, there's lots of research about light therapy just in general and how well it works. But I think red light therapy has the most research behind it. Got it. And, and what about sauna? Um, sauna is excellent too. I mean, there's tons of research showing uh, longevity benefits to heat saunas, uh, specifically dry heat saunas. And so um, I do a 30 minute sauna session every chance I get. So what about for those listening who are saying, I'm living in a sauna right now with this heat wave. I live Miami in the summer. I walk out, it's a sauna every day. Do I get any benefit from living in an extraordinarily uh, high temperature environment in the summer? Any benefit? Well, 100 degrees doesn't really cut it. And so uh, it's probably, probably, um, well, I will say that has not been studied. Let's talk, that, that has not been studied. But the saunas, you know, that, that we have um, at Next Health and the one I have at home, it goes up past 140 degrees. So we, we go into much higher heats for a specific amount of times. And the research has been done, a lot of the research has been done out of the Baltic countries where, they, yeah, where they, you know, regularly do this. <laughs> 
um, at high high temperatures. And cold. Let's talk about cold, whether it's hyperbaric or cold plunge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whether you do cryotherapy or cold plunge. Cryo, sorry. Uh, yeah. You know, Huberman had long podcasts on this, which was extremely uh, illuminating about the benefits of cold therapy. Um, and um, yeah, just even three minutes in, at, uh, in cold water or a cryotherapy chamber, or even probably even in a cold shower really does induce a physiological change. So mitochondria get healthier for the endorphin and the dopamine release is, is beneficial as well. And for anyone considering the combination of hot and cold, it's, it's always important to finish on cold. Could you talk about that? Yeah, exactly. So um, I, I think what a lot of the hormetic effects of cold therapy happen, not just like while you're in the cold, but in the, in the time period going from cold to warmed up again right to getting back to your normal core body temperature so if you're going into heat right afterwards it um it doesn't give your body that extended 20 to 30 minutes of warming itself up and that's why doing the cold last is important and what's too much because i think pe people get <laughs> right that's a great question yeah so some people are like i can spend 20 minutes in the cold plunge <laughs> I think the benefits become exponentially less um, impactful after about five minutes in the cold plunge. And how many days a week? I do it every day. If I can do it every day, I'll do it every day, the cold plunge, yep. Wow, good for you. Uh, and you mentioned NAD, so let's talk about that one. Maybe do a primer on it first. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, our body needs NAD to make ATP, and ATP is the energy molecule that are that our body makes for all of our organs, all of our cellular processes to have enough energy to, um, to do what they need to do. And so this whole energy balance thing in our body, like it just gets exponentially worse over time as we age. And whether you're a healthy person or an unhealthy person, it, it, it still happens just like your hormone levels go down. And, um, you know, the healthy ATP levels are the ATP levels that you have when you're in your late twenties, for example, or even in, even in adolescence. So NAD, giving people NAD intravenously, and there's a lot of research also about taking NAD precursors, oral, like NR, and, um, and some of these other um, um, supplements, um, has been shown to increase energy production in cells. And so I, I like NAD because, you know, I just know that me, even being an entrepreneur and living this chronically um, go, go, go lifestyle, my NAD levels are chronically probably very low. And you can actually test this now with some blood tests. And um, the NAD IV just gives the mitochondria the precursors it needs to produce more ATP. Got it. And it, so is there a feeling of energy that's attached to it? Absolutely. I mean, like, you know, sleep is better. You're, you're think clearer. And I mean, these are all the effects that I feel and many of my patients feel. You just have much more energy throughout your day and the, the subsequent next two or three days as well with the um, NAD. Any potential side effects? Some people have, um, you know, during the infusion, people have like this feeling of sometimes uh, like almost nausea or some chest tightness, in which case we lower the drip rate to make that go away. Um, and some people can't tolerate it at all. So, um, and some people don't have that at all. Like there's sometimes that I can do it that I have, I have none of that feeling. Um, but other than that, there's very little side effects to getting IV NAD. That I know of. So it sounds like you have a view of IV because there's also capsule form and they're the precursors. So there's capsule NAD, then there's capsule NMN and capsule nicotinamide riboside NR. Do you have a view on? Yeah. So I take capsule NMN and I do IV NAD. I would say I try to do it every week or two, but sometimes, you know, I just can't fit it in. It's a long infusion. It takes like two or three hours to do it. So yeah. You're there for a while, so so I uh, I you know can't fit that in all the time. So I do it whenever I can, but uh, usually um, that's a commitment. It's a commitment. Yeah, I can't do that. Uh, wow. Yeah, I'll sit down on my laptop and you know bang through a thousand emails <laughs> as I as I do it. So, what about some of the other IV treatments? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's IV nutrient therapy um, and uh, there's also glutathione that, that we do for people as well. Um, I think, you know, 
we all try to get all of our nutrients through food primarily, right? I mean, that's, that's eating good nutrient dense food is, is the, you know, level one, two, and three of what you need to be doing. Every once in a while, I just don't have a good week of eating nutrient dense foods. So I'll do an IV therapy session as well with nutrients. And so I want to bring it back to testosterone replacement therapy. Sure. What level, where, sh where should someone get in terms of a level where this is something they should consider? Yeah. So, so it's different for men and women, of course, right? So for men, we start raising the alarm once you're a little bit lower than three to 400. We're like, you know, you really need to start doing something about this. We want to get you up higher. And um, most men, I think in their um, 40s and 50s, want to be somewhere around four to 500 naturally, if you can get there or higher, of course. Um, obviously, like, you know, when you're in your 20s and your early 30s, your levels are closer to 900 to 1100, 1200. So really the optimal, optimal level, um, in my view, and many hormone replacement physicians views is trying to get to that level. So, um, and there's lots of research being done around, you know, testosterone has been shown to decrease your chance of Alzheimer's, decrease your chance of all cause mortality of um, heart disease, all of it at those levels. So um, when we treat people with testosterone replacement therapy, um, kind of, you know, we encourage them to definitely try to get themselves uh, higher testosterone levels with things like exercise and good nutrition, ashwagandha, other things. But if that doesn't work, we'll treat men to a level of 900 or so. And for women, it just kind of depends. We, we kind of titrate it to their symptoms. Ashwagandha, how much? I'm curious. Um, it's different, you know, like people def recommend different, <laughs> different levels of ashwagandha. I have two capsules I take every night when I go to, when I go to bed. Got it. Uh, what about ozone? Yeah, so ozone is another therapy that we do and it's extremely um, beneficial. Um, ozone therapy, we call it 10 pass ozone therapy. And what we do is 10 times we remove about 200 cc's of blood from your vein. We expose it to ozone and then we put that blood right back into the same vein. Okay, and we do that 10 times. So we're treating about two liters of blood with ozone. And what ozone therapy does is it, um, directly removes toxins from your bloodstream. So it finds viruses, fungi, um, other toxins, and it can remove them with the passive exposure to ozone. Wow, how long does that take? That's about an hour treatment. And then the, and, and the, the newest treatment that we're doing that's even more exciting that I'm super excited about is called therapeutic plasma exchange. So this is something that uh, Dr. Hyman just talked about in his last book, Longevity, and also Dr. Atia talked about. And we, we just brought this treatment in. And what we do with therapeutic plasma exchange is we actually hook you up to this big machine. It's about the size of um, like a laser treatment machine. And um, we remove blood from one vein in one arm we centrifuge it in this giant machine and we separate the plasma from the red blood cells and the white blood cells. Um, and if you've ever seen PRP, that's how they, they put in a centrifuge and they kind of separate it. So it's the same kind of thing, but we're doing it for a bigger volume of blood. And um, we completely remove the plasma. And the plasma is where all the toxins, the cytokines, all, all the protein complexes, lives right and your body is trying your body's a closed system is constantly trying to get rid of toxins through the liver and through the kidney it's constantly trying to get rid of these malformed proteins but it can only do so much so with the therapeutic plasma exchange we are actually physically removing it and then we're replacing that volume with albumin okay and so because you have to replace it with something and we replace it with albumin and um, we do this for about a two hour treatment and we get this huge bag of plasma, liters of plasma that you can physically see like people with high cholesterol, the cholesterol's in there. You can see that it's, it's dense with all the different toxins and things that need to be removed and we throw that away. Wow. So our friend Dave Asprey wants to live at 180. I don't think he's kidding. Where do you think we can take this in terms of our, our health span? 
Yeah. So all of the things that I'm talking about here are really going to help you improve your health span, right? Um, the number of years that we can stay feeling vital and energetic and um, and keep our heart alive, keep our brain alive, et cetera. But as far as lifespan extension goes, these technologies aren't going to move the needle a lot, right? They're going to probably add a few years to our life. And so longevity science, actually adding years to the end of our life, um, it's still really, really in its infancy, right? There's a few molecules that we know about. Um, you know, there's rapamycin. Rapamycin has a lot of promise for actually increasing longevity. Are you on rapamycin, Jason? No. Okay. So this is something that Atiyah loves and also talks about. A lot of us longevity doctors are taking eight milligrams of rapamycin every week right now. And um, there's a, the NIH is actually doing this incredible research project. It's on mice, but they're testing different molecules on these mice to see what really moves the needle for longevity for the mice. And rapamycin is one that has been shown to add about 20% to the lifespan of, of mice. But other than that, there's not a lot out there right now that's adding a lot of years to our life. And so- Well, quality too, because I think everyone wants quality years. Right, exactly. I think we're figuring that out now. Like, you know, the, you were saying, Atia said we can make heart disease an orphan disease, right? So imagine like eliminating, taking Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes off the table completely. We're going to live a lot more quality years. But um, really adding those years is still, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So for someone listening who's soaking all this in, but they're saying, you know what, I, I just don't have the time, you know, I'm busy. I have kids, work, family, whatever it might be. Of all these more futuristic treatments, is there one that you think is someone will experience the greatest return on their investment in terms of time investment and return? Yeah. I mean, and you know, for those people, I will say something like you almost can't afford not to dedicate some time to this, right? Like, like it's, you, you want, you don't want to end up, you know, 70 degree, 70 years old and not being able to recognize your family members. Right. So it really requires some dedication of time. But what I would say is you're going to get the most bang for your buck, you know, uh, spending most of your energy on the basics and then the stuff that you can do on a routine basis. So stuff that you can do almost on a daily basis, right? Either cold shower, hop in the hop in the ice bath, hop in a sauna, that kind of stuff is really going to move your needle because it's, the, it's that repeated dosing that really helps, right? Um, look at some of the supplements out there that really do move the needle. People are like, I'm, I'm so surprised. I see people all the time with vitamin D levels in the toilet, right? And so just, just looking at vitamin D, looking at um, things like fish oil supplements, et cetera, like those are the things that are going to be really impactful because you're going to do them daily instead of like once in a while. I'm glad you mentioned cold. I think that one is so interesting because the science is strong and it only takes three minutes. Yeah, exactly. And you can do it at home. Right. You don't necessarily need a cold plunge. You can you can hack it with a shower. It's not as enjoyable or a bath. Personally, I'm not a fan of the cold, but you, you can't argue with a three minute time investment. Exactly. You can't argue with that. So you mentioned vitamin D levels. Where do you like to see them? 50 to 80s, right? And, and this is another level that I think people need to measure and make sure they have it dialed in. Um, and the big thing about vitamin D is if it goes too high, you can actually induce calcium deposition in your blood vessels. You want to take vitamin D3 with K2 to prevent that from happening, but also you don't want to live at a level that's too high. So you want to get your supplementation of vitamin D like dialed in 50 to 80 is where you want it, which for most people is about two to 5,000 a day. And you mentioned fish oils. Where do you like to see DHA and EPA and you know, I just optimize. I, I tell everyone, everyone needs to be on fish oils and I and uh, fish oil supplements, and um, just get it to a normal level. Most people are not at a normal level. And so, of all the things, I look, I love the longevity conversation right now. I think it's fascinating, and to me, it's this blend of art and science. I think it's constantly evolving, and there are some treatments and modalities I find to be quite interesting and others I'm a little bit skeptical, maybe, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit of hype, a little bit of fluff. I'm curious of everything out there that you're hearing or seeing of people on the bleeding edge. Are there any treatments where you say, you know what, eh, science really isn't there yet. I'm a little bit skeptical. 
I would say most of the stuff out there that's like kind of on the fringe, you know, like I'm really skeptical about um, um, and things like, you know, there's all these devices that people will sell you now that you can have at your house to improve your longevity, things like, and thing and things, you know, there's different waters out there and things like that. I, I don't know about all that, but the thing that I think that is actually um, in my view going to move the needle is things like therapeutic plasma exchange, where you can see a direct benefit in blood biomarkers like immediately after the procedure's done and decrease in inflammation, decrease in toxin levels, decrease in cholesterol levels, bad cholesterol levels, et cetera. I think things like that are really gonna move the needle. The problem is, is that they're expensive and they're not readily available, right? And so, you know, as far as democratization of these technologies goes, that's the biggest problem. It's gonna take a while to get to that point. And um, we just got to keep keep making headway. <laughs> so you mentioned like home devices. What specifically? Like, are you talking about like EMFs or this could? I'm curious if there's some, something specific. Um, nothing really specific, and I don't want to trash any one piece of technology on here, right, right, right now. But yeah, I mean, th there's devices that kind of line up your water molecules in the right direction and things like that before you drink it. Um, I don't know. I, I just feel like there's there's a lot out there that they're making like leaps of science claims. Um, and I just like to see more clinical research being done on this stuff. You know, water is water's a tough one because we definitely, there was that horrific study that came out that essentially said that half of the drinking water in the U.S. is contaminated. And so what do you do? You know, there's filtered water and then there's all these different filtration systems. And then you have bottled water and then you've got all different. And so water is something like what, what, what's your view on water, how, how we should be thinking about it? Right. So my view on water is I try to eliminate the risk as much as possible. So I have a reverse osmosis system that's installed underneath my kitchen sink, and I only drink it out of glass bottles or metal bottles, or mainly glass bottles, actually. So um, try to avoid plastic at all possible. You got a glass bottle there, I see. So that's nice. You know, I, I use reverse osmosis. Well. What's the system? Because this question comes up in private conversations and in general, everyone is interested in filtration, but you go online and it's, oh my God, I don't know what's real. I don't know what's fake. I don't know what's a, a scam from. So what, I'm curious, what system do you have? Filtered water is different than reverse osmosis water, right? So reverse osmosis, you're directly separating the water molecules out from everything else. So the reverse osmosis system, I, I don't remember the name to be honest with you, Jason, my guy installed it years ago for me and it's still working. If you can find it, we'll put it in the show notes because this comes up a lot. Yes, yes. And you know what I do when I whenever I, I look up these systems, it changes year to year. So I like to go to consumer reports. I mean, they still do the best testing of these systems out there. So even like air filter systems and reverse osmosis, consumerreports.org, um, I think gives a really good unbiased view of what, what's good out there. So reverse osmosis. So, the, so what's your take on the classic water filter picture that most of us have at home? Is better than nothing, right? <laughs> Definitely better than nothing. But yeah, I'm a, I'm very skeptical of tap water. Um, I get my tap water tested, and it's all there's so much particulate matter in the tap water that is it's scary, right? And so I think I think you have to do something about the water for sure. How did you get it tested? Um, you can buy a test kit on online. Yeah, you can buy test kits online. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing to do. Everyone just search water test kit on Amazon and get one. If, and um, it's it's really eliminating. Um, and for detoxifying your environment, just in general, like where do we spend the most toxins come from our water, our food, and the air that we breathe. And almost like 50% more of the toxins in our body comes from the air we breathe. And so people um, people should really consider detoxifying their air in the places that they spend the most time, which are where the place where you sleep and the office that you work. So a good air filter in those, in those two areas are, I think, very beneficial. Any recommendations on, is it Consumer Reports again, or any particular brand you, you like on, on the filtration side of air? Um, no, I mean, just go to Consumer Reports. I have three different ones that we use. I think most of them are very, uh, mo most of the ones are good that um, that Consumer Reports recommends. Okay. Well, I, I do want to find the brands because what I struggle, what I struggle with, with this, with water and air is it can quickly go to a place where I'm not necessarily trusting 
the science. It, it, it's it's like a little bit snake oil sometimes, or a little bit conspiracy theory. And I think you know EMF is another one where, yes, I think there's something there, but to the ex- but it's it's I, I struggle with finding an expert who's really credentialed and knowledgeable to have a balanced nuanced conversation on the subject. Cause it quickly goes to conspiracy, you know, Bill Gates, the, the, the whole, I, I say, I, I think Bill Gates is a terrible husband, a little bit creepy, but I don't think he's, you know, trying to take over the world. Uh, so true. It's so true. And look, my feeling on EMF too is that there is some evidence that it is dangerous to be exposed to EMF all the time. And so um, I, I do believe in things like, you know, keeping your phone, like don't hold it up to your head all the time. Like use speakerphone or plug in headset. A plug in headset, right? Exactly. And, and, you know, don't have your Wi Fi router in your bedroom kind of a thing, you know? So I, I do try to limit the amount of EMF um, exposure that I have, but it is. You're right. It does go quickly down a bad rabbit hole sometimes. <laughs> so you're a parent. I'm a parent. How do you think about kids and the focus? Because that also can quickly become uh, unproductive with a child who you know likes to be a child and go to parties and eat birthday cake and run around and be a kid. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I think that... Um, I think that children are extremely, extremely re- resilient. Like our bodies are just so resilient at that age that they probably, you'd have to try really hard to cause a lot of long-term damage. But I think where we kind of fail our kids is we don't educate them enough and we just let them eat like the frozen waffles and the frozen pancakes and all that stuff. And, and you know, the protein is de-emphasized what I see in most households with kids, very little protein for our kids. Um, and also movement, like especially electronics nowadays, like kids just don't move enough. And that's why we see this kind of rising tide of childhood obesity that's like unrelenting right now. And so I think, you know, I think recognizing the kids are resilient, that taking them through the McDonald's drive through once every month or something is not going to kill them, but definitely letting them sit on their iPads all day long and not get outside and not move and just feed them processed food every day, day after day is going to hurt them. Right. And so I think it's just educating them and keeping them in a overall good environment, which I think comes from the parents. Like if, if we're healthy, our kids will follow our lead. They they do everything that we do by imitation. Well said. In closing, is there anything else we didn't touch on that you like to touch on, or perhaps some parting words of wisdom or advice or, or anything? Yeah, I mean, I think I think this was a great conversation. I would say that um, you know, just for most of your audience. Don't be hyper focused on the longevity technology like right off the bat. It is super interesting and there is a lot of great stuff coming out. Um, but um, really, really put a lot of energy and time into developing those routines and habits that you have consistently on a daily basis on the top four, right? Um, health, uh, top four um, healthy habits, which are your sleep, your exercise, your gut health, and your and your nutrition. Focus on that. That's going to take you the longest way in your health span. And then if you got that super dialed in, give us a call, talk to your doctor about some of the new stuff. I mean, it's exciting to watch and try. A lot of this stuff is like pretty low risk, but could have benefit. Well, I'm waiting for you to come to Miami. All right. We'll be there soon. (laughs) Thanks so much. Jason, thank you so much. That was a great conversation. And thanks for having me. Thank you.